Welcome everybody. It's right before 1130. We'll get started in just a moment. Can somebody put in the chat box that they can hear me? I want to make sure that you can hear me. Awesome. Loud and clear. That's fantastic. It's a good way to start a webinar, isn't it? <clears throat> Mary, I just emailed you my phone number in case anything wonky happens. Um, my moderator, who was going to be helping me out this morning, um, just had a baby. So I'm flying solo, but I think I've done enough of these that it won't be a problem. All right, let me get us started. We are recording. We are ready to go. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for um, joining me today as we talk about autism. Um, the title of our presentation today is Navigating the Transition Years for Individuals with Autism Spectrum Disorder. And we're specifically going to target and cover some resources for entering workforce and then also post-secondary education. Um, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, and I'm very excited that I get to partner and um, share this information with you guys. My name is Nikki Michalak. I am a research coordinator um, at the Center for Specialized Professional Support at Illinois State University. I have a long history working with individuals on the autism spectrum. Um, we had a grant through the Illinois State Board of Education from 2004 until gosh, about 2014, um, that we worked in families' homes. We built um, undergraduate and graduate curriculum at the university, at Illinois State University, um, for our pre-service and practicing teachers. <clears throat> and then a lot of the students that we started working with at the beginning of that grant, and even when I was in my undergraduate and graduate years, um, they were in school in elementary school and so now that we're in the you know the year that we're in a lot of those kiddos that i first started working with um a long time ago are no longer in that k-12 through school system and so i've had the wonderful joy and opportunity to help um, support their post-secondary transitions um, into both higher education as well as helping them in the workforce um, become successful employees. So I really enjoy providing training and professional learning. Um, technical assistance is truly where my heart is, going in and helping problem solve. Um, so I love consult consultations and coaching um, different people who are supporting individuals with autism and then, of course, supporting families and individuals themselves. Um, that's just a little bit about me. I'll share a little bit more about the grant um, as we move forward. I want to first introduce you to the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support. Um, the center, the ICSPS is what we're best known as, provides technical assistance, develops a lot of marketing tools and publications, um, and facilitates program improvement strategies for partners across the state of Illinois as they relate specifically to college transition, recruitment, retention, and completion. Um, and they always have a special focus on increasing achievement of learners with, um, from special populations. And so they are the, the center that the autism grant is housed in. <clears throat> and we have a wonderful working relationship with the Illinois State Board of Education. Um, that is our funding agency and everything that we do um, is available through this partnership with ICSPS and the Illinois State Board of Education. So the Autism Training and Technical Assistance Project seeks to develop and share resources to assist individuals with autism as they transition from secondary education into post-secondary education or employment. And so we've been around for this summer, 
will be our second year. So we're still pretty new, but ISBE started noticing, um, and there was a some requests to better support, um, as I know many of you are familiar with, the wave of students that are coming through who are exiting our school system, our K through 12 system, um, and entering adulthood. So they developed this, this project. And so we provide training um, and support to stakeholders, um, which many of you are stakeholders throughout our state um, who are joining us on the webinar today, and help us provide better opportunities to support individuals um, with autism. So we're very thankful for this grant and hopefully you'll be able to benefit from some of the resources that we have developed. <clears throat> this is um, our website. I wanted to throw it up there right at the beginning, Autism College and Career, um, so that you can navigate that. I'm going to hop over to the website at the very end of, not the very end, in the middle of the presentation so that we can explore some of the resources that are on there. And I also want you to um, know how to access them. In addition, um, you'll be able to download any of the resources. I'll talk about where the handouts are in just a moment, um, but you can access any of the resources that I'm sharing in the presentation from this website. The objectives of our grant truly are to provide um, autism resources that are specifically relevant to students who are transitioning into post-secondary. Um, so it's for the students, it's for, um, we had an advisory group come together at the beginning of the grant and they helped us outline and Mary's one of our wonderful um, stakeholders in our leadership committee who's really helped us identify what the target audiences are. And so if you go back to this slide really quick, these are our target audiences, individuals from the secondary system, so K through 12, um, the individual, the youth or the, the young adult themselves, um, post-secondary educators, um, our community members, which many of you are representing today, our families, and then employers. And so those are our different um, audiences that we've targeted. And so those are the areas in which we wanted to develop further resources in. Um, as we found that this is, you know, un uncharted territory and there's not a whole lot of resources out there specific to autism as individuals are transitioning. So luckily we have been funded to do this. So the purpose is really what's on the slide here and what I just said. And then here is our goal. I um, just wanted to make sure that those are there. And before we begin, I just wanted to update you on a few things logistically. Um, you'll see on your GoTo, if you're not familiar with GoToMeeting, you have your lovely council that um, hopefully is displaying on your screen. Um, and you have already been able to use the question box, which is awesome. So anytime you have a question, I will try to monitor it. If I don't get, or if I don't see your question, or if I don't respond to your question, I will go through and um, capture them all and I'll send a follow up FAQ document um, when I send the recording for the webinar. So everybody can have access to any of the, um, the questions that are there and I'll do my best to answer them as we're going along. But if I don't get to them, I'll definitely get, um, get the information back to you. <clears throat> I also wanna clarify just, um, Obviously, I don't know what everybody's backgrounds are. And so I some of the information are obviously not going to go into the details and characteristics of autism, but some of this might be um, review for you. Um, but I just wanted to throw some foundation information out there so that we all have a common understanding. Um, and then if you do have questions, please continue to use that question box. If you look below the question box, there is a little tab that says handouts. I put the PowerPoint handouts up there. Um, it only allows me to download or upload five documents. So um, if you want me to email you a specific web, uh, web resource that I share and you can't find it on the web, then um, let me know and I can email that to you directly. But everything else will be available on the website when we further explore it. So now hopping into the fun of autism spectrum disorders. Um, we're gonna start with that prevalence rate because that kind of sets the stage 
of um, why we're talking about what it is that we're talking about. As you all are very well aware, we know that there have been rapid changes um, in that prevalence rate of autism spectrum disorder. Um, current prevalence rate is one in 59. And as we know, there is um, more boys than, than girls. We are doing a better job at recognizing um, the females who oftentimes exhibit their characteristics a little bit differently. So it's a little bit harder to identify individuals, um, females who might be on the spectrum. But with this last um, data that we received from the CDC, it was identified that we are doing a better job um, recognizing when a female is on the spectrum. And then since a lot of us are in Illinois, I wanted to share some Illinois specific data. Um, and so this is data from um, our the Illinois State Board of Education. And what this shows is the trend, um, you know, over the past almost 20 years. And look at that, that trend line. Um, we are definitely seeing a, an increase of students who are receiving services underneath that eligibility criteria of autism. So right now, and I should get the, the most recent um, numbers probably in the next month or so. So this is the, the most recent year we have here is last year's school year. And in that 2017, 2017 year, there were 25,754 um, students who were receiving services underneath that eligibility criteria of autism. However, if you go back and you take a look at these numbers, one in 59, we would suspect that there probably is more than 25,754 students who are receiving services. Um, and there's a couple of different reasons for that. One is, is students receive this um, services for autism if they meet the eligibility criteria for an autism spectrum disorder um, and have an educational impact. There's an educational impact. Not every child, as you know, has that educational impact. And so um, they may not receive services underneath that eligibility criteria for autism. Also, every student that has autism does not necessarily receive services for autism. They might receive services underneath one of the other eligibility areas. Oftentimes, it's not uncommon um, that I've seen students receive services underneath other health impairment. Um, sometimes for you know, a certain um, time frame, students might receive services underneath the speech and language. So this doesn't account for everybody, and it doesn't account for the students who have autism but don't have an educational impact. So interesting information. Does anybody have any questions about this? I'm excited to see what the new numbers are going to show. Um, obviously, you can see the pretty trend line here. It, it continues to go up, which is very scary also. But what that also means is as we're looking into our future, um, oh no, something just went away. Um, we're gonna see many more students, um, here we go, um, by the year 2020, there are going to be close to a half a million individuals with autism who are transitioning into the adult world. That's a lot of individuals. Um, and with the increase in prevalence rate, we're also seeing individuals access higher ed. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit more about the, the number of students who are accessing um, college. More college students um, are entering higher ed, or more students are entering higher ed. Um, we're doing a better job in that K through 12 system um, preparing students. And then there's also some newer federally mandated um, policies that are supportive of students accessing higher ed um, at that post-secondary level. So we don't have really good data. If you take a look at these numbers, um, Look at that, There go, it goes from 16,000 to close to 400,000 um, individuals who have been identified. So we don't have really good data about who is um, 
what the current number of students are who are entering higher ed. Um, and to further complicate that, or not even complicate that, just to further explain that, um, we do know that that presence is increasing on college campuses. Here at Illinois State University, there um, we're seeing a similar trend where we, over the past four or five years, that we, um, we know that there's more students accessing services um, and disclosing that they have autism. So they're coming through the system. I'm, I'm taking a peek real quick. At your, there's a question that was at, asked back about the diagnosis. Is there more of an increase in people being diagnosed with autism or is it really more with autism every year? So I think that this is um, going back to that, the prevalence rate um, information. And what we are seeing is I think we are tr truly seeing an increase of numbers of individuals who are um, being diagnosed. So we have mo more individuals, but we are better at diagnosing. Um, there definitely are some gold standard tools out there that ADOS, um, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Scale, um, is kind of the gold standard diagnostic evaluation that is used. And it um, is a really good assessment and evaluation, especially when it's used in collaboration with other related service professionals. And so you get some speech language pathologists and some occupational therapists, and you get a full multidisciplinary um, evaluation. We're, we're definitely doing a better job. However, um, we know that because of these numbers um, and the data that the CDC shares is we're seeing a true increase. I'm trying to go back to that slide really quick. Um, can't find my mouse, there it is. Um, so we know that we, we're definitely seeing an increase um, of individuals who are diagnosed with autism. Um, and I'm often asked why that is. And I, um, we know that there is a true genetic link and then um, I went to a really interesting conference a couple of years ago, and Edwin Trey Bathan, he is the, um, he sat on the, one of the committees that helped define the criteria in the DSM-4. So that's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of um, Mental Disorders is where the criteria um, are outlined when um, that defines when someone might receive an autism diagnosis. And so he sat on one of those committees and he started talking to us about um, relating it to our diet and how they cured spina bifida. Is anyone familiar with how you how spina bifida was cured or what prevents spina bifida now? Any of you out there who have children or have um, of childbearing age there is a specific um, vitamin or mineral or that that it is recommended that um, you take when you're childbearing age, and that is folic acid. And so he started talking about um, the impact of our diet and nutrition on our bodies. And he said that there was, um, they started infusing the American or the wheat-based diet with folic acid. And over time, they started to see a decrease in the prevalence of spina bifida. However, there was one um, community that did not see that same change. Does anybody have any inklings of what that might be? Well, it was the Hispanic community because they eat a corn-based diet. And so um, they then started infusing the, the, corn, the folic acid into this corn-based diet and they, over time, also saw a decrease in the prevalence of spina bifida. And so he was relating that back to, okay, when did the fast food nation hit um, the United States? 1940s, 1950s. Um, and so our diet started changing at that time to include um, much more processed fast foods. And so he was saying, could this be the start of what um, we now know as epigenetics. And this is just one factor that kind of feeds into um, our environmental factors that are changing the human genome. And so he was saying, so it could it be an impact of our diet? 
Could it be all of the harsh chemicals? My house is right next to a field that does get sprayed. Um, some years it's a cornfield, some years it's soybean, um, but it gets sprayed. And so there's some chemicals that are put on our food that might leach down into our water system. There's other ways chemicals can get into our water system. All of the fluoride, think of some of the, um, the products we use to clean our homes, carpet cleaners. Um, and so these are all things that might somehow over time um, change the human genome. So he was saying that it's just not possibly one thing, but it, it might be all of these um, environmental toxins that over time then um, have changed the human genome. And so could it be that there is a genetic predisposition and then all of these other neurotoxins um, impact a child or they've tweaked the mother's DNA, which has then been passed down to the child and the child can't you know, metabolize and process through all of these other environmental toxins? And could that kind of be like a light switch where we're then seeing um, more individuals being diagnosed? So, so that could be a reason as to why we're seeing um, an increase. But what I can tell you is this one in 59 data, when the CDC, this was data that was um, collected in 2014 and it was released last, um, it's always released typically in March, the, the newest prevalence rate, prevalence rates. However, they um, change the way that we are classifying and diagnosing autism. So when the newest DSM was released, which was in May of 2013, um, they kind of had to realign and make sure that the way that we were collecting data um, and count and doing child count numbers um, really followed suit in how we've been collecting the autism prevalence rates in the years past. So um, if you hop onto the CDC's website um, and read some of the very interesting articles, which some of us, including me, do, um, there are other numbers out there that this one in 59 may not actually be um, correct, that it might be closer to one in 40 is what I've uh, ha heard others say and what I have found in some of those articles online. So it is scary. We are definitely seeing a true increase um, of individuals who have been diagnosed. So that was a little bunny trail. I seem to take those when I talk. <laughs> Sorry, hope that was informative. Um, so back to this slide, what we're seeing is we are definitely seeing an increase of individuals who um, are, are entering college campuses. Um, I showed you that data just a, a minute ago where it was, we had some um, colleges reporting or some data reporting. Researchers said there were 16,000 individuals who were accessing higher ed all the way up to almost 400,000. So as you can see, there's a broad range. We really don't know. Um, so it is a small, percentage, um, it's estimated to be about one to two percent of a college population. And then what's even scarier to think about or sad is there's only there's an 80 percent incompletion rate. So there's a very small percentage of those individuals who are going on and accessing college, um, community colleges and university, um, higher education. However, they're not um, remaining and they're not successfully f um, finishing those, those degrees. So that's out there. And then we do have some good information um, overall that students are entering unprepared in the areas of social communication and executive functioning. Um, and if you aren't familiar with what executive functioning skills are, it's kind of like the, the control center um, in your brain. It helps you with goal planning, time management, um, and so those are areas that some of our students are truly, truly struggling with. Um, and we often find that accommodations are put in place for things like academics. So a student might qualify for extended time on a test or a note taker. Um, however, these aren't always the, 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 the supports that our students need. Of course, they're beneficial, but some of our students obviously require other supports like independent living skills or more social supports or supports with organization. Um, and that's not something that our universities right now are necessarily doing a fantastic job of. 
but we're getting better. So there is, there's hope. So when we see, um, when we take a, a look at it at really a balcony view, a very high view and looking down, um, we're seeing challenges at a couple of different levels. We have individual challenges where we have students who are coming in unprepared and struggling in the areas that you see listed there, socially, academically, independent living, um, those that might have comorbid challenges going on. So other things like um, depression or anxiety, um, sleep issues, um, OCD, I think I might have mentioned, Tourette syndrome. So there's lots of comorbid challenges that an individual might experience that also impact them. And then again, I mentioned those executive functioning skills. And then you take a look at the institutional side where um, identification of individuals with autism, that's sometimes very hard to do on a college campus because that specifically relates to disclosure and some individuals um, aren't disclosing their autism, which I'm sure many of you who are on this call today have probably interacted with some individuals who um, may or may not have disclosed and that's a very personal um, decision for someone to make. And so um, we have some supports that can help someone with that disclosure component. Um, but then when we take a look at this, only one in three students with autism are graduating college. And so that's something that we need to do a better job of. There's another, uh, many individuals in our own community um, I know have gone on for multiple degrees. So they're very good at going to college. However, there's often a breakdown um, in employment. And so some of those skills that they're learning, they're really good and, and incredibly brilliant. However, there's a breakdown in, in connecting that to a long time career and gainful employment. So that's some of the hurdles as we're thinking about um, higher ed. Oh, my mouse went away. Hold on. Got to try to get to the next slide. There we go. Um, however, we do know that um, there are some strong benefits um, while an individual is in, is in school. And one of those primary goals is for a student with ASD to develop skills for a career. Even though we, um, we do know that college is not the end goal in itself, that that long-term career is um, really what that goal is, is to identify employment and also some career goals. And so education helps develop talent and those interests and can contribute to career and employee su employment success. So now switching over a little bit and changing our focus to um, employment, what do you think of these numbers? 35% of young adults between the ages of 19 and 23 with autism have not had a job, so they have not had gainful employment, nor have they received post-secondary education after leaving high school. What do you think of those numbers? In the different ways that you interact with individuals with autism, is this what you're seeing? And that's what the data is telling us is we also know that autism um, is the disability category with the highest level of unemployment. 85% of individuals with autism are unemployed. And then 50% of young adults between the ages of 21 and 26 have held a paid job outside of their household. So still pretty low numbers when we take a look at what's happening in the employment world. Um, so a part of this grant not only is to help support post-secondary educators, so working at that community college level as well as the university level to, to define and build different systems so that individuals with autism are better supported. Um, but not only that, our faculty who are teaching need to have more resources, more information um, on autism. However, we need to do the same with our employers. Um, and 
obviously many of you um, with um, associations with libraries in different capacities, we know that that is one place that many of our individuals with autism truly succeed for, for so many different reasons, that that is a great employment opportunity um, for individuals with autism. So I'll share some more resources specific to that in a minute. Got one more slide. And we talk about this varied um, employment outcomes. Just a little bit more data that shows, um, this is from Drexel Autism Institute. One of the reports that they did found that paid community-based employment was the least common outcome for individuals with ASD, which is in line with the data that I just shared on the previous slide. Only 14% held a job for pay in the community, which is even lower than, um, well, it goes right, right around with that 85% unemployment rate, but 14% held a job for pay in the community. Um, and then over half, 54%, participated in an unpaid activity in a facility where most other workers had a disability. So that often um, means that they were they were in a facilita facility, however, it was not gainful employment. <clears throat> Only one in five adults with autism works full time with an average earnings of $8 an hour. So very low pay. And then more than half of those with autism received no vocational or life skills um, at all in their 20s. And when we think about that K through 12 system, um, it is mandated by IDEA that they have um, employment training. Vocation is written into some of those laws and that's what schools should be doing. Um, please add and comment in the, the chat box, are you working with individuals while they are still in that K through 12 system and providing them different opportunities for employment? Or, And that looks very different. Um, I know, do you have, I guess the first question I should ask is, do you have relationships with your local school districts? And do you think you're doing um, a good job at employing and making connections for students to have opportunities. And while you're thinking about that, I'm going to read some of these questions that have come in. The first question is, is the unemployment statistic because of the social interaction aspects? Um, the social, I would say, when I talk about the skills needed, I truly feel that um, for an individual with autism, we can teach any skill, just like when we go to academics, we can teach any academic skill um, to an extent, but that lifelong skill that um, is going to set someone apart is exactly what you mentioned. It's that social component. Um, we know the social world is an incredibly difficult um, thing to navigate for, for many of us who don't have social challenges, but then for someone with autism who, um, navigating that social world is just an incredible um, difficulty at times. And so, yeah, that social component definitely um, is what sets individuals apart. And then the next question, you might be addressing this later on, but what kind of programs would you suggest for communities to offer to help individuals gain more skills for employment? <laughs> I'll, I'll give you some tips and some resources. Um, and then as always, um, I mentioned this at the beginning, you can, I'm very happy to reach out and help. Um, I think if we start small in these little, in many of our communities across our state and um, start plowing the way, we're gonna be doing a better job. There's many resources out there that we can utilize to help change um, what we're seeing and hopefully increase those um, employment opportunities. We need to do a better job engaging with um, businesses. Um, and I have some resources as to why it will, what we can do, um, what are the benefits of hiring somebody with autism? What do they bring to the table? Why would you want to? There's so many great strengths that an individual with autism has that we really need to do a better job tapping into those. So moving right along to our web portal. So I started off at the beginning talking to you about um, our website and it truly is a resource area. And so what I'm gonna do next 
is I am going to hop out of my slideshow really quick and I am going to um, open up my Adobe and I want to share some of these resources. So um, as I showed you in those different six different areas, you can go actually maybe I'll start with the website really quick. So can everybody still see, can you see the website right now? I want to make sure you're seeing what I'm intending to show. You're seeing the document. So let me pull this back over on the other screen. So now you can see the website. Is that correct? Just confirming. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay. So the homepage of the website, autismcollegeandcareer.com. Like I said, it's broken into these six, six different areas. And as I mentioned, we are just in our second year, um, approaching our second year. And our first year wasn't even truly a full first year. It was, um, it started in the middle of the, the fiscal year. So we um, worked pretty quickly to get some supports and resources in place. So when we go to each one of these areas, if you click on secondary, which was the first area that I opened up, um, there is a short two minute little video that explains what the resources are. So I'm gonna show you one of these. I'm not gonna show you one for all of them. Hopefully the audio will work. If it doesn't, please, shout out in that question area and I will stop it. But here's what um, an example of um, what this video might look like. Transition planning refers to the process by which a student moves from middle school to high school and from high school to adult life. For students with autism spectrum disorder, the transition from high school to post-school options is a complex process that requires planning and coordination to ensure appropriate supports and positive outcomes. In the state of Illinois, the transition process should begin by age 14 and a half or earlier and includes the student, educators, families, and other members of the educational team in order to begin the important task of developing a transition plan that outlines the student's experience, educational services, supports, and post-secondary goals. Effective transition planning is a multi-year process that leads students to better post-school outcomes, such as employment or college, as well as participation in their communities. Each student's transition plan should be unique and tailored to their individual needs, interests, skills, and strengths. By systematically addressing the transition process, students with ASD will be prepared. The middle and high school section overviews tools and resources specific to educators to aid in the development of a comprehensive transition plan. All right, so that is just one example. Um, when you go to the website, what you'll see is each one of our areas I think each one, we might still be working on one of these videos, but each one has an intro video kind of explaining and overviewing what resources can be found in, in each of the different areas. So with our leadership group, we prioritized a couple of different areas. And at first we worked on um, post-secondary and employers. And then as I started um, researching and finding resources and developing our own resources, um, you can't do that without including um, the individual themselves and then really starting um, in that K through 12 system because we know if we do a better job writing those transition goals um, and transition plans that that's where we're gonna see the biggest bang but we also have to tie it to each of these different areas so you'll find that there are more resources in, sec in probably the student area and secondary, and then definitely post-secondary and employers. And then we're taking some of these same documents and resources that we've created in these areas, and we're going to be adding more and adapting some of them for community. So I'll share some of those. So when we look at, um, let's go into the student young adult. Um, each, the, the heading, the area, the tabs are up here, and you can go into resources. And so for the, specifically for the individual, individual, we have some information on interviewing tips. So 
what does that look like? Before your interview, here's what you want to do. Um, and these are great resources for you to be able to share with individuals um, just as a resource. They're also, I know some of you probably work one on one with individuals and might help coach them um, prior to um, them seeking out employment. And so these are just some tips that they can um, take and learn and um, hopefully inform how they would um, go through that interview process. I'm going to pull up my, I had that here. So I had uh, interviewing tips. So we have the interviewing tips. And then right along with the interviewing tips, we have kind of a self-assessment that individuals might be able to use. So it talks about those same aspects that are listed in before the interview, and it has them on a rating scale so that they can work towards some of those different areas. So before the interview, here are some different things, and they can write it during the interview, which you would probably self-assess after. You're not gonna have this sheet out in front of you. But did I arrive on time? Um, when I came to the interview, was I dressed neatly in clothes that show that I want to look professional? So it's kind of like a checklist um, that individuals can use, and it has lots of different um, things that they can go over. And if they rate it as you know a one, then it's something that they can um, work towards. The rating scale is up here so that they know specifically what that means. And so if they're saying they never wash their hair or comb it, then that's probably something that might set them apart. And our appearance, our hygiene um, can set us apart from getting that job. And so that's why it's important that we have broken down um, these skills so that individuals know exactly what is expected of them during that interview process. <clears throat> and then to help with um, thinking about jobs. This is one that is still in um, draft form, but it is available. It'll be updated shortly. But as you're thinking about career exploration or job exploration, um, it helps a person um, write some of these things down visually. What we know about individuals with autism is they are very, very visual and they really truly strive on structure and routine. So any way that we can try to structure something up to help um, be supportive of them. So this is just a um, job interest form. What are my talents and strengths? How might these talents and strengths help me do my job better? What types of jobs am I interested in? Based on my skills, experiences, education level, what kind of jobs could I obtain right now? What are my long-term career goals? And then how is this job going to fit into my long-term career, career goals? Are my career goals realistic? <clears throat> what specific steps do I need to take? So kind of breaks down exploring what a job might be. And so those are done. I'm gonna close these out really quick so I don't go back to them. Um, and then as I started out with initially, um, this is another one that we include underneath that employer employment area on the site, and it is getting the best from an employee with ASD, 10 tips for job success. And as I'm looking at this right now, I need to update our statistics because this was obviously created before our prevalence rate increased, ever changing. But what it does is it talks about <clears throat> why what can I do as an employer to help support an individual? So if you are going to hire someone with autism, um, we know that being very specific and providing um, boundaries and very detailed expectations is going to help that individual be very, very, um, be more successful. And so as an employer, when we're looking to hire someone with, with autism, we want to make sure that we are precise and we are very specific about what those job instructions need to be. And the more that we can be specific and black and white in our thinking and how we're sharing information is, is going to be very supportive of, of someone with autism. Um, 
I'm a very literal per person. Um, I sometimes need very specific instructions on what I'm supposed to do. And if we can help someone out by providing that information up front, it's going to be, um, it's going to help them be more um, su successful. So we need to be specific about what is rigid and what is flexible within a job. Um, oftentimes individuals um, like things broken down. So anytime we can make logical steps for a task and just break down the task into smaller components, that's going to be helpful. Um, fill in what's missing. If there's something that a, an individual is not doing in their task, again, we can go back up and we can include it um, based on that individual's needs. Obviously, all of this is going to be dependent upon the level of support that a person needs, but I always caution and say is if you can write down and provide as much information, then um, that's going to be very su supportive. Um, and so this is just a document that talks about what you as an employer can do. And then the next one is, why should I hire someone with autism? Um, oftentimes we kind of overthink and we hear a lot about the deficits um, and the challenges that a person might, um, might, be, might experience. However, an individual with autism has so many strengths and there are so many positive reasons that we can um, that we should hire them. So more often than not, <clears throat> they are trustworthy, they are dependable, they are loyal employees. Um, they have a very strong sense of detail, detail and intense um, attention, which I would say is why the library is probably a fantastic employment place for individuals with autism, um, because they can kind of dive into their world and um, really focus on that area in which they are interested in. They are individuals who have untapped skills, untapped sk talent, um, and they have different ways of thinking, which I think truly expands. Um, when you get multiple people together, their thinking truly adds and can expand where things are going. They are process and visual thinkers, problem solving, integrity, um, what I, when I'm talking to employers, I always say, you, these are your individuals who aren't going to spend, you know, an hour of their day socially chatting because that's not something they find interest in. They're going to be very devoted to their work. And so they're going to have a high, high, um, work success or product success. They're going to be pumping out their, their tasks just because they spend more time focused on that um that work and if their job is related to something that they have an interest in that's only going to be um hyper that's only going to be something that benefits you because they're hyper focused in an area that might be their passion um their retention i've also heard from employers that they don't often call in sick unless they truly are sick um, they will be the person that shows up um, on all of the holidays because that is their routine. And so the turnover rate for employees with autism is significantly less. And then all employees benefit from the sports that are put in place. Um, they kind of help everybody have a common understanding and they, when clear definitions and clear expectations are defined, um, it's not only supportive of individuals with autism. So, and that's a beautiful thing about any of these resources is they work for all um, and not only specific um, people with autism. Another thing is um, we worked on this and this is just a very generic form, but it's something that is very useful. If you are in the process of hiring or even if you are working through that um, with your school districts and, and providing some vocational opportunities or volunteer opportunities, what help, what's helpful is to break down the job and maybe provide your job description in a different format where um, I know the job descriptions, we're working on one at the university right now to hire somebody. And I mean, we have loads and loads of paragraphs and that might be too much information for somebody to, to, pro to over process and, and think through. So if we can break it down um, and just bullet, like what would be the job? responsibilities, job duties, 
What are the skills that are needed to perform this task or job? What are the physical requirements? Um, what is that environment like? What are those sensory components that a person needs to be aware of? Um, because we know that sensory is a huge component and in many individuals, I, I think I still have yet to meet someone who is not impacted um, by sensory. We all, you know, all the information that we take in through our environment is processed. It's all sensory information. Um, but sometimes we have individuals who are um, auditory sensitive. Um, they can hear the 60 cycle um, sounds that the fluorescent light, lights make. And then they might have a hypersensitivity to that olfactory sense so they can um, heighten sense of smell. And so just as long as they know some of these information going into it is helpful for, for them. And this is just a really easy way for an employee to break down um, and make a job description a little bit more easier for um, an individual with autism to um, complete and understand. So that's just another resource. And I see there's a question in here. What if the employer is unaware that the employee has autism? So what you're gonna find is this is gonna be very, very common. And I have, um, I don't think I put it up here, but on the website, let me see if I can pull that up really quick. Um, we have, I think it is under, it might be under post-secondary, it might be also under employment, but it talks about Disclosure, when should I disclose my autism? And so this is something that would be supportive um, of the individual to talk about um, disclosure. But nonetheless, if someone doesn't feel comfortable disclosing, what I urge them to do is talk about the supports that would be put in place to be successful. For me, um, I need to have a very detailed calendar. Um, and so I need to make sure that my calendars are synced up with my colleagues' calendars so that we can all see who's doing what at one time. But this is no different. You're going to obviously come in contact and work with individuals who um, may not have an autism diagnosis, but may um, benefit from some of the strategies. And so it's not uncommon that an employer is unaware that an employee has autism. And I often say that that label should not drive the services. But if you identify people need certain needs, then um, you can provide those needs um, without identifying them as an autism support. And I'm happy to problem solve um, and talk to you more about that and come up with some specific um, ways to help support you and what that might look like. So we have this, talks about um, the benefits of um, what you might do if you're a person with autism who is going to disclose, but we also put this underneath that employment um, area just because we know it is a, a common, common topic that we find um, that disclosure, many, many people choose to not disclose. And then what else was I gonna share with you on here? Social communication, we talked about social communication earlier. Um, and so what we did is we broke it down. Um, Social communication is something that will set you apart or can set you apart in that work environment. And so it talks about, for instance, this first little indicator. A supervisor is a person who is in charge of certain aspects of a company and manages the work of other employees. Do I recognize who my supervisor is and respond to them in a respectful manner? And so I, a lot of these assessments that we've created, we've actually shared with that K through 12 system. So as they are working in that student's transition plan, that these are different um, tools that they can use. And I've had some of our um, teachers who are a part of our initial work groups, they have gone through some of these um, assessments and they've actually had the students use them as self-assessments and then they go back and they take a look at the, the teacher and the student take a look at the data together and then they'll use those um, as IEP goals and so they will use them as a teaching opportunity and so yeah that social communication is huge and like I said that to me is one of those lifelong skills that we need to really do a better job focusing on um, the moment students enter that school system because it's that social component that um, is going to be the lifelong skill. 
And I've heard of how that social component has um, impacted individuals from maintaining their jobs. And it's hard. Social Socialization for everybody is hard. So, and then this is just a, another self-assessment. This was modified from um, Marshall University. They have an actual program for individuals with autism. And so this is used as a part of their um, interview process when they are accepting individuals into their programs. Um, but we use it again with teachers um, for students who are on that post-secondary track. Um, and when I say post-secondary, it's just not college. It's any type of further education, further training, tech school, um, vocational training. So these are just skills and areas that um, individuals might need to work on as they are um, developing skills to transition into the adult world. So what I want to wrap up with as we are in our final few minutes is just making sure that you are very well aware of the Autism and Training and Technical Assistance Project. Um, hopefully as you go in and you navigate any of these um, six different areas, you will see many resources. You just have to hop into that resources um, area or sometimes the self-assessment. We're still building the self-assessments underneath the employment area. But um, go through, scroll, we, we do link out to other um, organizations. Um, Autism Speaks is a wonderful organization and has fantastic resources. And so you'll see oftentimes links to different organizations that um, have really good resources. We don't wanna reinvent the wheel if somebody else is already doing it. So um, we have some really good resources and links to other to other resources. And I think Mary, you had just put another one in here. You had a conversation with Spark Employment Specialists at a recent conference. They work to help individuals with intellectual and other developmental disabilities such as autism to find gainful employment and um, learn workplace skills. Um, yeah, so there's lots of different organizations now that are doing a much better job supporting individuals as they um, seek out employment and these groups will help employers um do that i wanted to share one last thing since i know i have a bunch of librarians on here let me see if i can pull back up my presentation really quickly um, and i want to give a shout out i also sit on our autism mclean um, board it is our lo local autism organization it began in 2002 by a single parent who was looking for supports um, in, for her son austin um, and we are still in existence and we have grown tremendously. And one of our latest endeavors um, are sensory friendly bags. And so what you, so we, um, we started off with I think 50 bags and we bought and compiled together another 50 bags. And then I, we had a board meeting last night and we just approved funding for an additional 100 bags and we're going to start spearheading this um, within our community. But each of these bags, very quickly, um, includes visual communication cues. Um, so you see a couple of different um, examples here. We have the five point scale. Um, and so this is something that could be used for an individual to identify um, where, what they are feeling like. As I said, um, multiple people on the autism spectrum are visual learners and oftentimes if they are stressed, they lose the ability to um, access words if they are a verbal child. Um, and even if they are very verbal with stress and anxiety, they, they do lose um, sometimes the, the ability to use their words. So anytime we can provide visuals throughout your environment, whether it's labels of where different things are, um, that is a great thing to do. But in our sensory kit, we have some communication tools. We also have, um, sorry, my computer decides that it wants to do some updates. Let me cancel out of that really quick. Um, we have on the right here, it says, I want. So those are just items that are included in the sensory bag, except we don't have snacks in there, but hopefully um, they brought snacks. Um, the five point scale, if you're not familiar with that, it's a one to five scale and it equates pictures with um, your, your emotional state. So 
We typically want kids to be at a one, but oftentimes if that sensory environment is overstimulating, they might be up to a five. And then it gives you different um, strategies on the items that are in that sensory friendly bag on what they can do to bring themselves if they're at like a four or five where they're angry, frustrated or overwhelmed, what can I use to bring me back, back down to a one? So here we recommend pulling out the um, headphones, stress ball, tingle toys, some of the fidgets that are in the um, thing. Oftentimes, a lot of our students and kiddos, they need help um, with transitioning. And so this is a transition board. You have three minutes left, you have two minutes left, you have one minute left, time to transition. So those are just a few of the um, communication supports that are in this bag. And then <clears throat> we also have headphones. I think there are 27 decibel reduction, so it kind of blocks out all of the extra noise, even though our libraries sometimes are not the most quiet places. Um, we do know that our kids may be a little bit louder, um, but this the headphones kind of block out any of that background noise that's going on. Um, we have here the purple, the marble, and mesh. That's one of my absolute favorites, where you can just fidget with it, fidget spinner, a tangle. And then these are specific. They're not just sunglasses. They're light filtering um, sunglasses. So those we have our normal, both our Bloomington Public Library and normal public library have, I think, five or six of them. The normal library keeps five of them available in the children's area. And then they have one that is available. They have a wellness room. So if somebody does get overstimulated and needs a moment to go um, chill or hang out, calm their body down, um, there is a room, a calming room, calming area for them. And then also um, have access to these resources. So we are right at our time. I'm sorry for going a minute over, but I wanted to make sure that I shared that wonderful resource for you. And if you wanted um, more access, more information on those sensory bags, please also feel free to reach out to me. My information is on that printed um, handout that hopefully you were able to download. Um, shoot me an email at any time. I'm happy to problem solve. This is a statewide grant, so if you need support building um, a more front autism friendly um, business, community effort, library, I am happy to come out and support you in any way that I can. So I hope you're walking away with at least um, a new tool that you can download from our website that you think might be supportive um, of whatever role you have. And um, again, feel free to contact me. Thank you for your time today.